I think we can um, come to the first speaker. Um, Stephanie Weidkamp-Peters is also one of our co-organizers of this meeting. Um, she is now in, uh, in Düsseldorf. She originally studied biology in Würzburg and got her diploma in 2003. She then moved to Jena to the group of Peter Hemmerich, where she, where she got her PhD in 2007 on the assembly of centromeres and PML bodies in living cells. Um, a study which was involving FRAP and fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. Um, and it looks like it was quite successful because she got six publications out of it, three of them as first author. So um, she then moved to Düsseldorf, uh, where she, she still is, but first, first she moved to the group of Hans from, from, from Klaus Seidel, um, a group which is in the physical chemistry department. And um, she worked on stuff like multi-parameter fluorescence image spectroscopy to study molecular interactions. So that sounds like pretty hardcore biophysics to me as a biologist, um, but um, she also can explain things very well. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, in 2011, she became head of something that then became the CHI, the Center of Advanced Imaging. So she essentially built it up uh, as a head of it. And um, last March, she also became vice president of the German Bioimaging. Um, I, I'm not really sure where I met Steffi first, but I do remember that uh, we definitely met at a course for core facility um, managers, which was in Constance, which was organized by German Bioimaging. And um, since then, I uh, cherish her as a very good uh, scientist and uh, as, a, as a good colleague to talk with, in particular, uh, about all issues in FLIM. And with that, um, oh, I should mention probably the title of the talk. Um, the title of the talk is on my list which is somewhere here behind. And the title of the talk is Introduction to Fluorescence Lifetime Imaging Microscopy. And with that, Steffi, please, you have the stage. Okay, thank you very much for the very nice and kind introduction, Steffen. And I guess we really met before this course, but uh, you cannot remember. <laughs> it was on a DGZ meeting in Berlin. I'm absolutely sure about this. Okay, so it is my very great pleasure to give the first talk of the meeting and now I will try to share my screen with you um, and start the presentation. Okay, so I hope you see my presentation now. Yeah, great. Um, so my talk will not present many applications um, but I will really go back to the basics. So I will give you a lecture style talk to um, introduce fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy. And I decided also to include anisotropy imaging a little bit because it's another parameter um, that is uh, in, in the daily use of most biologists applying microscopy more or less invisible, but it's still there. And this is why we raised the idea of, of having this kind of a symposium, we need to share the knowledge also with you as biologists um, and that you start thinking about applying those, those techniques to get more information out of your lovely fluorescence images you are uh, taking all the time. And yeah, let's see how we can make it work. So, um, we are definitely used to look at fluorescence intensities every day and every, in every project. And we are really used to uh, also look over the complete spectral range. So everybody of you who is applying microscopy using confocal microscopy, for example, knows how to, do, to deal with these kind of different colors with different um, spectra, excitation and emission spectra. So you are able to select the right filters and uh, to run really sophisticated, uh, maybe setups for separating those different spectra. And you are also used to uh, follow fluorescence over time a lot by doing, for example, live cell imaging. This is now a plant cell. And what you see is a receptor, Carvata 1, tagged with GFB. And that's a maximum intensity projection um, of, of these cell and you see all these vesicles moving around and that's what we do every day. And um, if we look 
more to to more sophisticated techniques what was mentioned by by Stefan what I did before I went into the field of first sense lifetime imaging was a lot of um, first sense recovery after photo bleaching stuff and um, also single particle tracking. Actually, these are data that were acquired when, when Thomas was, Thomas Sobel was uh, in my team. So FRAP and single photon, uh, um, single particle tracking. Again, we only look for first sense intensities now. So over time, but we do not look for fluorescence lifetime. Okay. So, but we know fluorescence signal contains more information. And this is what I would call at the moment the invisible parameters of fluorescence, because you need some extra equipment and some extra knowledge um, to look for it and then also to work with it, with it to make use of it. So this is now one image to a sense intensity image. Again, this is a piece of a plant cell. That's the uh, HE2 cells, because what you see here um, are the, um, the, the cell walls here and the membranes of two plant cells. And you see the intensity image. Again, we look um, at a receptor in, in a plant cell, ACR4, GFP tech, and that's just the intensity now of the eGFP signal. But there, there's much more information within the image. And this is shown now here in the fluorescence lifetime image. Again, it's just the ACR4 channel we are looking at here. But now we have some lifetime information here. And you see that there are definitely changes from these sites here, these are the plasmodesmata in the cell wall of cells, and these region around the membrane. So there's a, a different in fluorescence lifetime and also in fluorescence anisotropy, if you also measure the anisotropy of these images. So these are the invisible parameters and the goal of, of the symposium or the two goals of the symposium are now um, to, to give you some examples how you could make use of FLIM and also anisotropy imaging for your biological research. And this is covered mainly by the talks. We have very, very good um, invited speakers here. They all will present to you super interesting and super exciting applications of fluorescence lifetime imaging and also um, related techniques to you. And that's a really a good chance for you to get new ideas and to also start applying these kind of techniques if you have the equipment available. And this is, if you have a core facility around, uh, uh, very likely that you have access to this kind of equipment. And um, we also want to show you in our hands-on sessions, how you really can measure the invisible parameters in your biological samples. And for that, we prepared uh, pre-recorded workshops and also live hands-on workshops for you. And in these kind of workshops, uh, you should be able really to interact with the workshop providers and to ask your questions for your samples. And um, we hope at the end of the meeting, yeah, you really start working with this kind of techniques. Okay. so. What are the things we have to talk about in the first introductory talk? So we have to talk about what is first sense lifetime, of course. And then, of course, how can we measure first sense lifetime? And I decided to also include anisotropy. So what is first sense anisotropy and how to measure this one? And then, of course, why, as a biologist, should we consider using FLIM and anisotropy imaging and biology? What could be your motivation to do it. And because my motivation is clear, we are super interested in, in um, looking at interaction of, of different proteins and also oligomerization. My motivation is mainly that we are um, looking for first resonance energy transfer. And I would like to introduce to you um, the observation of hetero and homofred in biological samples but only very briefly, only the basics, the technique behind. And then uh, in the next talk by Yvonne Stahl, she's my colleague here in, in Düsseldorf, she will give you very nice applications for uh, hetero and homofat measurements in plant tissue. 
Okay, so let's get started. So fluorescence lifetime, what is it? It's the lifetime of the excited state of a fluorophore. So it is defined by the average time the molecule spends in the excited state before returning to the ground state. And you see here, these are different fluorophores in these glasses here. And um, many of them are now in excited state because they have been excited by UV light and they are emitting photons. And that's what we are using all the time. We are looking for the first sense signal, the intensities. Okay, a very, very good way to explain first sense lifetime is by looking at the Jablonski diagram. So if you look to the diagram, um, you have here different states a molecule can um, be in. So we start here with a ground state and then it can go up to excited state as one and as two, singulate ground state and excited singulate states. And um, coming to, to an excited state is um, for, for a fluorophore by absorbing light and that's shown here. So the molecule is now in the excited state here and now it wants to get rid of the energy. So it can either get rid of energy a little bit by internal conversion, that's just heat. That's um, the easiest way to get rid of energy is just by giving heat away. And that's the first process. And then it can go on with um, this kind of vibrations and just um, um, emitting heat. But what we are interested in is the next thing what can happen and that's the emission of fluorescence. So that's the process we are interested in. Absorption of light, for example, laser light in the microscope, then the molecule is excited and then it's emitting a photon and that's what we detect as fluorescence. Um, so due to the stock shift, you have always a, a different emission wavelengths, different from the excitation wavelengths. So it's always less energy. This is why we have a longer wavelength here. That's not, that's not important at the moment. Okay, so, and um, another way to get rid of energy for the molecule is um, going uh, into inter-system crossing and entering the triplet state. And the, then we won't see fluorescence from that specific molecule, but there might be phosphorescence, but it's in a different, completely different um, time scale. However, you can even use the phosphorescence as a readout and this will be a topic of the talk of Angelika Rück and Wolfgang Becker. They will talk about how you can record even phosphorescence lifetime and how you can make use of it. So now what we have is we have different processes. That's the fluorescence emission. We have internal conversion and we have inter-system crossing going on. And all these processes are the ways to get rid of the energy. So, but it takes some time and that's the average lifetime of a certain molecule. So how long does it stay um, into this excited state? That's the average lifetime. And that's always in the nanosecond range, as you can see here. And um, the good thing is that this is super characteristic for each fluorophore. So you can even use it to separate different fluorophores um, imagine if they are in the same spectral range. For example, you have two green fluorophores. If they have different fluorescence lifetime and you are able to record the lifetime, you can separate it. So you can open up um, the, or you can increase the number of fluorophores you can use, for example, in a simple staining. And um, this will also be covered um, in our lectures uh, to show you what are the ways to, to make use of the lifetime for separation of different fluorophores. Okay, so fluorescence lifetime is um, something that is characteristic for each fluorophore, however, it can change. And that strongly depends on the environment. And um, also how sensitive a fluorophore is to the environment, of course, depends a lot on the molecule structure. But in most cases, the fluorophores are sensitive to, for example, pH changes, they can even be used as reporters for pH. Or, for example, if personal resonance energy transfer is going on, 
then also lifetime will change of the donor molecule who, what, um, which wants to get rid of energy. So overall lifetime can be, the flow sense lifetime can be used as a very precise reporter for environmental changes, also for interaction and also for higher states of oligomerization and so on. Okay, so a very typical flow for um, is uh, FITSI, FIRSI, what you can see here. And among all these values describing the properties of the flu for, you also find the first sense lifetime. And you see here a typical value. Um, it's um, 4.16 nanosecond in a certain solution. So it will change if you change here the buffer for, for solution. And um, yeah, this is what we are looking for now, how to measure first sense lifetime. Okay, so how can we do it? So we can either measure in the time domain. Uh, this is what we are doing here in Düsseldorf. And I guess that's um, the, the method most people are applying. However, you can also do it in, in the frequency domain. And that might have some benefits for uh, specific applications. And you really have to consider which kind of, of uh, method you want to apply if you are looking to first sense lifetime. And um, this method, will be in detail explained by another expert who is Gerhard Holz from PCO. He will give a talk tomorrow about how you apply frequency domain lifetime measurements. Okay, so, but I will talk about the time domain and what kind of specific equipment is needed. It's two things, it's pulsed excitation. You, you will need short excitation pulses from a, from a laser source and you need a fast detection unit for doing it, for really counting the photons when they arrive after a laser pulse. And that's shown here. Yeah, you have laser pulses, and then you really need to stop the time when a photon arrives just after the laser pulse excited something. Okay, and this is what you collect over time. You have to collect over time because the result of your measurement of your first sense lifetime um, imaging microscopy experiment is a lifetime histogram. So you put all the arrival times of photons into a table like this, in a histogram like this, to come up with the lifetime histogram. And from that, you can extract the first sense lifetime here. Okay. So that's how you measure first sense lifetime if you work in the time domain. Okay. And the whole process is called time correlated single photon counting, TCSPC. Okay, so this is how it looks like. That's a schematic drawing of a, a setup for TCSPC. So what you need is a pulse laser. You can feed it into your microscope setup onto your sample, then first sense is excited and will be emitted by the flu force. Um, and then it is collected in detectors that are also single photon uh, sensitive avalanche photodiodes, for example, or hybrid detectors, anything that is sensitive enough to collect single photons. And then the information goes into the TCSPC unit. And of course you have to have a very, very good synchronization with the laser excitation. Okay, and this is how it could look like in reality. That's one of our film setups that's now uh, controlled from Olympus and that's in addition equipped with a PicoQuant uh, setup here for, for doing film and also anisotropy imaging. So, but I mean, you can have any variant that is available on the market. Okay. So that's how to measure first sense lifetime. And this is, could be one of the results. That's a typical histogram now. So what you see here in blue is the laser pulse itself. And then that's now a sum of all the photon uh, signals arriving during the measurement. So you have again and again these laser pulses and all the histogram, uh, all the photons that arrived after excitation are now summed up in the histogram. And from that, you can calculate the first sense lifetime. In this case, it's up to 488, a very uh, common, uh, very nice rule for, 
and that's uh, that has a, a lifetime in this case of 3.8 nanoseconds. Okay, so that's about first sense lifetime. So next thing I want to talk about, I really want to like to introduce it to you because it's quite easy to measure is first sense anisotropy. So first sense anisotropy measurements um, document the orientation of flow force in your sample. So light has a direction and also the emission of light from your flow force has a direction and you can make use of it. So how can you measure anisotropy in, in an optical microscope? So what is needed is polarized light and that usually comes with, a, with your laser. So you don't even need a pulsed laser, you can also use a continuous wave laser. Uh, for, for doing anisotropy measurements, but you need polarized light, which has a direction. Okay, and on the detection side, um, you instead of a, a color beam splitter, you, you should use then a polarizing beam splitter. Those, this beam splitter will separate for parallel or perpendicular orientation of the light. And then you have two detectors. One is um, detecting the perpendicular light and the other one is detecting the parallel light. Okay, so now imagine you have um, a solution with completely immobile fluid force now. Yeah? So they are not moving in any direction. They are just completely immobile because maybe it's a, the solvent has a very, very high viscosity and so they just cannot move around. So what happens now if you excite those fluid force with a uh, polarized excitation light with a laser, then only those one, those flow force are excited, which are in parallel to the excitation light. Yeah, the dipole moments should be in parallel to the excitation light. And this process is called, called photoselection. That happens all the time. You will never, in your sample, you will never at the same time excite all flow force because it strongly depends on the orientation of the dipole moments. Okay, so now, if now the photons emit, uh, the, the uh, flu force emit their photons, all the light will be still in the same direction as the excitation laser light was. So it's always parallel, yeah? So what you detect is a lot of light in the parallel detector and only um, a little bit of light in the perpendicular detector. So, uh, that's shown here. So what you have is intensity in parallel is super high and intensity in perpendicular is super low. That means you have a very high anisotropy. Okay. So now imagine we have the other case. So now we have very super mobile flu force, like a very small molecule, like rather than 110 in solution, super mobile moving around all the time. What happens now if you excite? Again, the same case as before, photoselection is going on. Only those ones that are in parallel can be excited. But now, because they are so super fast in uh, rotating and diffusing around, these molecules will turn around and will emit in a different direction. And um, this is due to the fact that they just rotate around all the time. And so what you detect now, now with your two, with your setup with two detectors is you detect the same signal in the parallel and perpendicular uh, channel because all the molecules um, have been rotating and now um, they have the chance to emit in all directions. Okay, so now we have a very low anisotropy. Okay. So, and um, the process, you now remember that um, you excited your flu for to excited state and that um, it only stays for a few nanoseconds in the excited state. Okay, so the process, the rotational diffusion time must be faster than um, the molecule is in excited state before emission. So that's a super fast process, what's going on here, okay. So what we measure is um, something, uh, what is the rotational correlation time? This will heavily influence the anisotropy and de that depends on the, 
on the molecule itself or on the solvent. It is in, is it is in, but on top, anything that changes the um, the direction of emission of your fluorophore can influence the anisotropy. And I will show you later on that also the process of energy transfer can uh, influence the direction of emission of a pool of, of fluorophores you are looking at. And that can be very useful. Okay, that's the fluorescence anisotropy. So how can you calculate now a number to come up with a number as a result of your measurement? So it's quite easy. Anisotropy R can be calculated according to this formula. So you look only at intensities. So what I did not put in here is a correction factor, but this can be easily explained. And then, yeah, but what you see here is a very easy um, formula and you can come up with a, with a value to compare different anisotropies. Okay, so, and how can you make use of it? So anisotropy is a readout for either um, rotational correlation time, depending on the size and shape of your molecules. For example, here, if you have small dye molecules, also the, the shape of these molecules can influence the rotational diffusion time. So how fast can they uh, rotate before they emit a photon? And of course, uh, it's influenced by the viscosity of the solvent. For example, if your molecules are stick to membrane, they will not rotate very fast. So you, you will get high anisotropy. And um, in case of GF, GFP, what is a quite big molecule, 27 kilodalton, it is quite clear that this has usually a very, very high anisotropy. But now again, um, a process like, like FET can influence it in, in terms of homo FET going on between two GFP molecules, you can observe a decrease in anisotropy. And this will, I will explain this to you a little bit later on. Okay, so now you should know uh, how to measure the sense lifetime, how to measure anisotropy. But why should we do that? That's now the big question. So um, why using FLIM and anisotropy imaging in biology? Of course, you want to understand cellular machineries and living cells, and that's what I also want to do. And um, so we do a lot of plant imaging. This is here a very nice um, example of a plant cell in leaf tissue of Nicotiana ventamiana leaves. And Yvonne later on will explain in detail uh, how these samples look like and how we can make use of it for our measurements. And we are, of course, inter interested in, in investigating protein interaction, for example, in the membrane or during oligomerization, or if the proteins get internalized, as you can see here. And we are also very interested in where and how do these proteins interact because biochemistry will not tell you. Yeah, that's only something that is, um, is um, exclusively done by, by imaging methods where you have information about the spatial distribution of your molecules. And of course, if everything is super cool, you want to quantify, you really want to know how many proteins do interact in a specific state, for example, of the, of the cell. Yeah? And uh, what we are using heavily in this result is FET, first service resistance energy transfer. That's, as I told you, our motivation to use uh, first and lifetime imaging microscopy and also to look into anisotropy. Okay, that's a very elegant method. And I would like to share you now with you some um, information about threat first or first sense resonance energy transfer. So what is needed? You need a donor flow for, and that then can transfer energy to an acceptor flow for if, and there are now three very important ifs. If there's a spectral overlap between the excitation um, spectrum, no, the emission spectrum of your donor flow for here and the excitation spectrum of your acceptor flow for. So that works. That can happen between, in this case, EGFP and m -Sherry. Okay, and of course, these two fluorophores have to come very close to each other. Very close means below 10 nanometer. And that's really now 
something what I would call an indirect super resolution method. So you cannot resolve 10 nanometers easily, uh, especially not in living cells, but you can look for threat and then you know, okay, these two guys are uh, closer to each other uh, than 10 nanometers. And that's then a very good hint if you observe that, that you, uh, the proteins you are interested in are interacting. Okay. And another prerequisite, and that's a really a nasty thing, is um, the dipole moments of the chloroforms have to have a almost parallel orientation. Otherwise, there won't be a, an energy, <clears throat> energy transfer. Yeah, and then for this, you have to really to be lucky that your configuration of your proteins of interest fits with this prerequisite. Because I mean, if you then for because of this reason, because you don't have the uh, correct dipole orientation, do not observe that you don't know anything. Your proteins could interact, but there's just no energy transfer going on. Okay. So. Fat in biology is usually done like this. You have fluorophores, um, and this this is these uh, fluorescent proteins like the GFP and cherry, whatever, any variants are possible, um, as long as they have this overlapping spectra. And these uh, fluorescent proteins or also fluorophores are somehow attached to your proteins of interest. And in case of no threat, you only observe your donor fluorophore and the emission from your donor fluorophore here in green, but in case of FET, you additionally can observe now the emission from your acceptor flu for because there was energy transfer going on. And that's a very good readout now for protein interaction and oligomerization. So um, in the hetero FET case, the readout is in the end that the fluorescence intensity of your donor drops while the acceptor intensity will increase. And on top, and this is why it's super interesting now for fluorescence lifetime imaging, also the fluorescence lifetime of the donor will decrease in case of energy transfer. So in case of homo thread, now we look at the anisotropy, we can observe something else. Again, we have this energy transfer in, in the case here. And now what we observe is that the fluorescence anisotropy is going down now of, in this case, the GFP molecules. Okay, so how can you measure these different things? So you can, of course, measure fluorescence intensities of donor and acceptor, and that's a very nice, easy method here. For this one, you don't need special equipment, um, but it's a very nice method, method for the first try, if um, FET is going on, it's called acceptor photo bleaching, and uh, Yvonne will later on give you an example for this. But we are interested in the more sophisticated readout, and that's the sense lifetime imaging. So FLIM to check for lifetime in case of energy transfer. And to measure homo FET, you would need a setup for anisotropy imaging, and for this, you need this polarizing beam splitter um, in your detection path. Okay, so now it's really worth to, to um, look again to the Diagonsky diagram in case of red, because again, this diagram is um, very nice uh, to show the effect of red on the lifetime, because what we have now is again, absorption and internal conversion, and then the fluorescence, first process, another process, intersystem crossing to triplet state. And now, in addition, because we have the acceptor flow for around with the right dipole dipole coupling and with um, below 10 nanometers, and um, the possibility because of overlapping spectra to transfer the energy, and then it takes place, the acceptor, acceptor will take energy here from the donor molecule. And now that's another way to get rid of the energy for this guy here. So, and this is the reason because now we have another factor, another rate constant um, summing up here uh, to one over a lifetime. That's the, the reason why we have a decrease now in first sense lifetime because there's just another channel 
for the excited molecule to get rid of the energy. Okay, and that's in the end a decrease in first sense lifetime of the donor molecules. Okay, so what we observe, donor lifetime and first sense intensity decrease because another process is going on. And for the acceptor, we observe an intensity increase. Okay. So now in flim fat measurements, what we now observe in our histogram is another shape because we now detect more photons arriving after um, a shorter time after the laser pulse. And that can be seen in our histogram. And if we now fit our histogram, we should be able also from the histogram to recover the shorter lifetime in case of threat. Okay, so in homofet, again, the readout is anisotropy and the anisotropy will decrease due to the polar depolarization effect now. If you assume um, EGP molecules here, no FET going on between those molecules that are just in, in solution or in cytoplasm or whatever, and they are photoselected and because they are super big molecules, they cannot move around very fast. Um, they will stay almost in the same position. They have now a very high anisotropy, as you can see here. They are still all in parallel to the excitation. So we have a very high value for anisotropy. But now if we have a, a fusion between two GFP molecules here, then what we have here now, these are all these two um, GFP molecules fused together. What we have now is energy transfer. And as you can see here, now emission comes from the acceptor molecule and that has a slightly different orientation than the donor molecule. And that will in the end lead to a decrease in, in an isotropy. And that can be measured easily and that's a good indicator for homofet going on and for something like oligomerization of the same kind of molecule. The nice thing here is that you just work with one label, so you don't have to, to produce two different, for example, fusion proteins. And that might be an idea sometimes to, to use anisotropy imaging for this kind of questions. Is oligomerization going on or what's going on in my sample? Okay, so. And that's um, the homo thread, um process going on. If you really have heavily ongoing oligomerization, the anisotropy will really dramatically drop. And that's contraintuitive because you would think, okay, that's a really big GFP molecules and now they cannot move at all, but energy is migrating. So the energy is moving somehow. And that's why you get the depolarization effect. And it's really working, even if you have something very simple like here EGFP and then a fusion of two EGFP molecules, you already can see um, the decreased anisotropy due to the homo threat effect. And you can recover the anisotropy to almost the monomeric um, variant here by bleaching away of a fraction of these GFP molecules that, they, that there is not much energy transfer going on in this case, and then you recover the anisotropy to the higher value in just single EGFP molecules. Okay, so that might be something you should, you can consider for, for the next experiments you are doing. Okay, so that's already my last slide. Um, so what is presence lifetime? We talked about this, how to measure, yes, yes, yes. And um, so at the end, I would say now you are prepared for the complete symposium now. So, and I really would like to wish you uh, fun with the exciting applications of FLIM and friends. So anisotropy and FLIM and so on in the following talks and also workshops. And that's everything from my side. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Steffi. And yeah. Um, 
Um, your talk did stimulate uh, quite a bunch of questions, and maybe I just read them off here in the chat. Some of them are privately to me, others are public, so don't wonder if there is something that you can't see. So the first was from Hella, why is there a factor two in total anisotropy uh, for, for perpendicular anisotropy? Sorry, I, can you repeat the question? Why is there a factor two in total anisotropy for perpendicular anisotropy? What was the beginning? So I have to see, maybe I can have a look to the chat. You can't see that, it's a private no. Why is there a factor of two? Ah, a factor of two. Yeah. Uh, there won't be always an exact factor of two. So, um, I mean, if you, it, so there is also this uh, maximum value of fundamental anisotropy of 0.4 for the one photon excitation. And um, if you really want to look into it, I would recommend the chapter, the, uh, the uh, textbook chapter of Steven Vogel that was also mentioned on one of my slides, who is explaining the behavior in terms of anisotropy of fluid force and how you can calculate, um, um, yeah, well, what are the, what is the theoretical background, what you should consider for the, the anisotropy values you can get. So, um, yeah, that's it, I have to say. So it's, it's really worth to look in this um, textbook chapter because he's explaining it in a very nice way without many formulas. And um, yeah, I guess that's the best answer I can give to that. Without many formulas usually sounds good to the biologist. Um. <laughs> ah, now I see also the, the questions, okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, then there is what, so some of these questions came in quite early. You might have explained them already later on in your talk. Um, there was, what is the reason for reducing anisotropy in homofret? Yeah, that's the de de depolarization effect. So um, the point is that if you have homo transfer between two fluorophores that are in very close vicinity, the, um, the acceptor fluorophore is now the one that will emit and the dipole orientation might be or is a little bit different from the almost parallel orientation of the donor. And that's why you have a depolarization. So it is slightly um, um, more in perpendicular direction than still in parallel. That's why you have um, a decrease in anisotropy in homofret. Okay. Can I Thank you. And then we have, uh, what would be an example of an actual experiment where homofret could be used? Okay, that, um, that's a very nice question. And uh, Yvonne will, um, will answer this in her talk, but you can, for example, make use of it for oligomerization processes. So if you, for example, in a membrane uh, upon a signal can observe um, oligomerization, uh, then you should, you should see homofret going on between these molecules become, because they come closer and closer. And yeah, that's the reason, or that could be an example um, where you can use um, homofret. And you can combine it even with heterofret. So if you have uh, different molecules, you, you might be able to, to see if you have um, rather homo-oligomerization going on or even hetero-oligomerization. So that's quite sensitive for this, um, yeah. There is another one that I've skipped accidentally. It says, um, in homofret, is it always the same for a molecule as opposed, I think, that's yes. not the question, but that's my guess. Could you also use like GFP and Alexa 488? Uh, no. Um, no, I guess not. So, um, However, it's in the same spectral range. But I'm not sure. I mean, the point is to, to if you have a mixture of Alexa 488 or R2488 and uh, the big GFP molecule, so what's going on? So what is attached? It, it depends on, on the complete thing. It's, if it's just in solution, it does not make sense. Um, it really depends now on the complex you are building. So is the Alexa also attached to, to, a, big, to a big protein? So that, that's maybe um, yeah, the point you have to 
make clear. However, I mean, it's the easiest way is to, to look for the same molecules and that's, for example, GFP, GFP. Yeah. Um, another question is, how can you measure the dipole of your two proteins of interest? Uh -huh. uh, can you? That would be maybe the first question. So, no, only it's just an indirect um, readout. So you can maybe do it in, in single molecule experiments in solution, very clean environment, very uh, defined buffer, or whatever. However, I mean, the, the, the point is, um, if you have a mission, then you have been able to excite your molecule. And that means it has, at a certain point, it was in, in the right direction to be excited, yeah, in parallel to the excitation light. And um, what you, I mean, the, the point is why should you know what is the dipole orientation? So if, if you have a, I mean, you can, for example, put um, a very small di molecule in different um, solvents with different viscosities and you, then you have different kind of, of um, degree of, of anisotropic behavior, yeah. But what you, maybe it's in the question is in that direction, can you make um, assumptions about um, a GF, GF, GFP molecule attached to, to um, another protein of interest, yeah. Can you, um, know in advance how it will behave? And the answer is no in most ways. So there's um, not a smart way at the moment for, for like, like a general rule, how you should um, plan your fusion between GFP or any other fluorescent protein and your protein of interest. So that's not very easy. You really have to try it out. Yeah, that's the other, that's the best way. If this, if the question was in that direction, that would be the answer. You have to try it out. And in most cases you cannot uh, beforehand say, okay, that's the best um, orientation you can have. There is another question, which has a very, very practical touch. And that is, is there any characteristics of a fluorophore which makes it poor for anisotropy? I would say it's like, um, through forth that bleach struck away very fast and so on. He's, but that's true for, for all other techniques also. So, so how about the size? What would you prefer if you could choose? Rather big or rather small? Rather big, because then you see the changes. And that makes GFP a, a nice choice. Right. Yeah, the book chapter, I can put the link to the chat. Okay. Um, can we check the mobility of transmembrane mo molecules using anisotropy before we use FRAP to measure it? No. Because what the most likely the readout will be that you have high anisotropy because the, the molecules are um, in the membrane, integrated into the membrane. And um, then the easiest way is to, to, measure, FRAP, to measure FRAP here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's not, so mm, the point is mobility in, in anisotropy, in the anisotropy range is really in, in um, rotational diffusion time or, and these things are in the uh, nanosecond range, yeah? And uh, FRAP and all these things are more in the, yeah, millisecond to second to minute range. So it's different um, time scales. So oh, um, we have a lot of questions about anisotropy, yeah. not so much about general FLIM, which maybe indicates that the people assembled here have already did their homework before, mm -hmm. at least a rough idea of what's going on in FLIM. And that's a good thing. Maybe one last question before we move on to the next part, um, mm -hmm. talk. I'm, I'm sorry we can't, um, we can't answer all of them. Um, so the last question would be, if both dipoles align parallel in homofred, then what will happen to the anisotropy? So would you still see anything or not? Could, could you have a situation where you see nothing at all? Would be my... Uh, if both dipoles align parallel in... Ah, okay, then you would see nothing. Yeah. Because if everything is just immobile and everything is just parallel, then nothing will change. But that's very unlikely to happen. Even if they are both, let's say, membrane bound or something, you will still see a little bit of wiggling. 
yeah, that's that's uh, really surprising. So we tried it several times, and it's definitely um, sensitive to that, to this very small, yeah, um, being not still completely parallel. The changes that's very sensitive to these changes. Yeah, but if everything is is completely immobile, you won't see anything. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Steffi. Um, I'm sorry we didn't answer all the questions, um, but we have to move on. Otherwise, we run already very late and very soon. Um, and let's move then to the next talk.